And now we finally come into the end of the 2010 decade animated feature film retrospective of the Oscars. Yes, that's right. After doing, starting with the animated nominees and winners of 2016 through 19, doing individual review, individual reviews of all those five nominees and winners when during the year of their ceremonies, and for the past two months, looking at the retrospectives of the pre of the rest of the 2010 decade from 2010 to 2015, just in time for Oscar week, I will be ranking all the best animated feature winners of the 2010 decade. This is not best animated featured film entirely, so this doesn't count any of the films from 2001 through 2009, specifically from Shrek to Up. This is only going to be from Toy Story 3 to Toy Story 4. And this is going to be a very interesting ranking list. Now, for the past few retrospectives I have done for this, I have done this in written form. But since we're in a new era on my channel, I want to try to go back and try to like show my honesty at best of my per my ranking of these animations without um, any written material, but I do have like notes like or I know what to talk about when I will be um, ranking these because I kind of have rehearsed myself a little bit to talk about these. So remember, this is only going to be the animated winners of the 2010 decade. Now I have, if you have seen the rest of the 2010 retrospectives on my channel, you can check them out before you can check this one. So the 2010 nominees through the 2015 nominees and um, where you will see all the rankings on I did. And if you watch the reviews on the winning films I did, which were Zootopia, Coco, Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse and Toy Story 4, you'll find the ranking of all those five nominees in those individual reviews. Now, I will, of course, have to make this disclaimer because, of course, many people would probably be um, going to be like, you know, how they would be. But remember, people, this is all my opinion. If you are going to be disagreeing with elements that I might have on the list, then that could be your problem and not mine. And like, for an example, if I say this is not actually on its position, but say if I put Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse at number 10 or at Brave at number one, then you guys would be freaking out if it's just a matter of a personal opinion. That, that's not the actual position on the list. But I just hope I just want to say that some people would be a bit angry on where the positions I would have these winners. But this is, of course, not just on my opinion, but this is kind of like what other the nominees from their respective year that I think that should have won the Oscar instead of that. So with that being said, let's get this started. So starting this up at number 10, I have to say, I can't say it's the worst animated feature winner of all time, because of course this does, I have not seen all the animated feature winners ever, because the only three I still have yet to watch are Spirited Away, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, and Happy Feet. But just in this decade alone, I think some people are already going to exit off this video unless they have seen one of the year's retrospectives. And you might know what I'm talking about. What I consider to be the worst animated feature film winner of the decade is Frozen. Yeah, so already some people probably already left this video already. So um, I will say this, like I said in the 2013 video, I am not one of those people that is in the massive war on Arendelle type of persons like that just wants to have people to tell them to shut up about Frozen or just like how Disney is making it a big billion dollar um, grossing franchise. Um, as I have stated in the 2013 video uh, before I even um, officially started doing this retrospective it was my first time watching the first film and I do consider overrated, of course. I don't consider it the most overrated Oscar nominee in animated feature of the decade. For me, that would be uh, Anomalisa. But it's like the second most overrated one. And if there is one infamous example on why I consider this movie extremely overrated uh, is, of course, Elsa. I mean, it's just like 
how she's written and Adina Menzel's performance is just an absolute, like, she's just like an absolute jerk. Now, I know in the source material, the original fairy tale of the Snow Queen, that she is supposed to be a villain. But in here, it's a little bit different. Um, probably the most infamous character that um, some people compare Elsa to is the Beast from Beauty and the Beast. But at least with the Beast... It actually worked because it was understandable and why his temper tantrum was, like, on how the script was written, the source material, and Robbie Benson's performance. With Elsa, on the other hand, with those three combined with the source material, it just doesn't, doesn't work and doesn't answer a lot of questions on, like, like, yeah, of course, another comparison, of course, this movie is beginning to is The Lion King, of course, um, as explained in the Honest trailer of The Lion King. Um, but it's just, like, the script is, like, not that well done, I would say. And, of course, it's just, like, it's odd. I mean, it, there is, like, a saving grace, I would say, um, if I would ever, like, uh, Elsa would probably be in the Disney parks. Um, but I think that would just be it. Uh, but I just don't like Elsa in the first film. Like, it would prop, like, she would be a nice character to meet at the Disney parks, but not in this film. No. Um, also, um, I would say, um, the musical numbers, as I said, they are good on their own. It's just the, that, um, they don't work well on the movie, per se. And it's very odd that the only song I like from Kristen Anderson, Lopez, and Robert Lopez is just, the Oscar-winning song Remember Me from Coco, and I'm not a fan of, like, their musical ones on Frozen, Frozen 2, or even the 2011 Winnie the Pooh film. Um, the Book of Mormon, that's a different, um, thing, of course, because that's just Robert Lopez behind it, but just with them together. Um, yeah, I don't really get it, and, like, if there are, like, legit saving graces, I would say, um, as I try to mention a little bit. Um, the saving grace for the first film for making it the worst, um, animated feature nominee is Elsa. No, wait, no, 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 I meant Anna, I meant Anna. I don't know why I said Elsa there, um, but Anna is the saving grace of the movie, and this is mainly due to the phenomenal performance by Kristen Bell, um, it's just like her character is like so enthusiastic and although of course um it is understandable she doesn't know about Elsa's curse because of the beginning if you saw in the opening prologue of the film but um she, it's just like her amazement and just trying to actually care about her sister is definitely one thing I really do admire um I will of course as I said it Olaf is actually not really that annoying in the first film I will say that I barely forgot about Kristoff and Sven in the film. Um, and I will admit there are some jokes in the lyric, um, some lyrics I actually did laugh at. Um, I think, like, there was one I did laugh at for Love is an o Open Door. I don't remember if, this is, if it was the sandwiches part. I don't know, but, um, so, yeah, I did not, con I really did not like this film. And, all the other four nominees from that year were better contenders. For me, I would have been chosen from that year's lineup, Despicable Me 2. At number nine, this one many people consider to be the worst animated feature winner of the decade, or perhaps of all time, is Brave. Now, yes, it's interesting. I do prefer watching this one over Frozen. And if there is one thing what Brave did better than Frozen is... At least it had a great climax. Like, the last 20 minutes of Brave were definitely great. But the rest of it, however... Oh, man. I just don't like... The, I just don't like the mother-daughter synopsis of Merida and um, Queen Eleanor. Especially during the first act. I mean... Oh, man. I did not like any of the characters whatsoever. I mean... Even uh, Kelly McDonald's performance makes Merida really, really annoying. Like... Like, as I had mentioned in the 2012 retrospective of showing that clip from Ralph Breaks the Internet, because you can't understand her. Like, it's so true how it is. And, um, it's very odd. Like, of course the animation is definitely well done, although I would say probably some of the faces of some of the human characters might be a bit off. And, um, King Fergus would probably be the only decent character 
the humor isn't really that well spot on. And although Morg Duke seems like an interesting villain, it kind of he kind of really does, but I I forgot what I mentioned in the 2012 retrospective, but I think there could have been a little bit more development on this um bear than era of the film, but um and it's very odd. It's kind of like um it's like if I like I mentioned about if um it would I wouldn't mind meeting Elsa in the Disney parks. I wouldn't mind meeting Merida at the Disney parks. Of course, I would definitely be a big person to meet Anna at the Disney parks. Um but when it comes to Pixar's first attempt at a Disney princess, it's eh. Like, I do understand there was a little bit of trouble to production with the, with the relationship between Brendan Chapman and the executive producers, especially with then John, with John Laster. But, um, yeah, even though she was impressed that it was actually almost similar to her actual project that she wanted, even though she still got the directing credit, because, if I'm correct, she and Mark Andrews did 50% of the movie, um, so... Yeah, but there was major better contenders I would have said about um, this film in particular, like for the 2012 year. Like, Wreck-It Ralph easily should have been the winner, and we can all agree with that one without a doubt, because, uh, yeah, as of course I mentioned a bit, Ralph Breaks the Internet and did poke Von Merida as like the big middle finger for, you gave it to the right dis, you gave the animated feature category to a Disney film, but you picked the wrong Disney film. And I think many people would agree with it. That was a big mistake, even though Braid was a competing well with Wreck-It Ralph during the award season. And number eight, I have what is to be the biggest surprise or upset of the animated feature winners of the decade, and that is Big Hero 6. Um, for some people who probably don't know, I am not a big, massive uh, superhero buff. Um, I don't know if it's just, like, they're not really well entertaining, or it's just, like, the superhero bias fan base considers, like, films like Avengers Endgame is the greatest film of all time. Like, yeah, right. Um, but, like, there are, like, enjoyable things I do like about, some like, some superhero things. Like, I love the airport battle scene in Captain America Civil War, and I do love some of the fan-made videos, especially from How It Should Have Ended. But when it comes to their movies entirely, it's just like, I don't get it. And this is one that it's okay at best. It's like, I like how Disney ended up trying to make a little bit of a different approach to the uh, Marvel, these Marvel characters here. But um, it's just like the plot is not really that well spot on, I would say. Like, yeah, it is kind of, does have an emotional impact with um, the death of Tadashi, he Hiro's brother, in the first act. Um, it's just like with the plot twist revealing a Professor Callahan being the man in the kabuki mask, just wasn't really that well of a spot on villain. Um, Hiro's friends, um, not really that um, um, well entertaining, I would say, in the film specifically. Um, and, like, Baymax is probably the only enjoyable thing, but there's, like, some humor with it. And Aunt May, uh, I hate my Rudolph. Uh, oh, well. But, um, yeah, of course, many people know that there was a big controversy when it came to this... Um, the actual ballots of the film where most of the members didn't watch all of the nominated films and ended up actually, um, uh, like some, some of the voters even let their kids choose it instead of, uh, themselves. And as I stated in the 2014 retrospective, if you are a lazy voter for either nomination ballots or just an actual voting ballot, then you should not be a member of the Academy if you're that lazy. And if you don't care about animation, that's just a big thing. If you think animation is a kid, then you should be ashamed of yourself because you know Brad Bird would easily say that, of course, animated films are not a genre. You know he would not be happy if anyone says that. It's a media of feature films, not a genre. Superheroes are. Um, but, yeah, even though it is, I would prefer watching it over Frozen, but... There were like three other better films, I would say, and the one I really think that should have won this, even um, even though I didn't like it when I first watched it, 
for my review of the third film of the series, but when I revisited for the 2014 retrospective, um, How to Train Your Dragon 2 should have won that Oscar, without a doubt. Because, like, yeah, it's odd that a second time really helped that for me, and I really think it should have won that over Big Hero 6. I don't know why it didn't happen, but... Okay, okay, I know, because of the voting thing, but I'm just like, really? Like, they would go with, like... Oh, boy. But, yeah, I did not know why. But after revisiting How to Train Your Dragon 2, that should have won instead of Big Hero 6. And even the two indie films were better than that. But, yeah, it's better than Frozen, but um, I wouldn't choose it as my winner either. At number 7, I have Inside Out. And um, it was a bit skeptical going to revisit it when I was doing the 2015 retrospective because um, this was one of the three animated feature winners I did saw on the big screen the other one being Brave and one other one as well and um, it's not one of Pixar's best I would say of all time but it is um, definitely one of the best written animated films from Pixar. Like, one of the best written Pixar films specifically. Definitely a worthy, deserved original screenplay nomination. It is well written in any way, shape, or form. And with the emotional impact of the feature. The reason why it's a bit lower is because the issue only I have with it is probably with some of the characters maybe because of their performances, like with Amy Poehler as Joy, or maybe Phyllis Smith as Sad, or especially Richard Hunt as Bing Bong being to a uh, molt, as I said, if you didn't get the reference, it was a molt from A Bug's Life, which he did the voice for that character. Um, like, that was my only issue, but the rest of it really did well, worked well, with the unique amount of colors of its production design, um, inside the headquarters and throughout the entirety of Riley's mind. Um, but the, like, and also with the designs of how their emotions are, it really worked. And of course, the emotional impact, especially during the climax of the film. Um, the reason why it's a bit lower, of course, because there was only one animated film I did prefer watch. I would think that should have won that, and that would have been um, um, Ardman's Shaun the Sheep movie. I had a great time with that. Even though I did have a good time with Inside Out, and I do think it is the best animated script of 2015, but um, I think that um, the Sheep should have won this. But I really didn't have a good time with it. Would be a pick, Would it be a Pixar film that I would revisit? Um, probably not a while, but if I ever get the chance to, if I owned it on Blu-ray or something like that, I might go back and revisit it. At number six, what I consider what I think the Academy would say would be their best animated feature winner of the 2010 decade, and that is Toy Story 3. This is kind of a shock that this is a little bit lower in the list, and the reason why I say I think this is what the Academy would say would be their best winner, because... It's the only animated film of that decade to get a Best Picture nomination. I mean, when are we ever going to see another one? Soul tried, but that did not work. Um, I don't know when we're going to get another one in the future. But um, as I stated in the 2010 retrospective, um, I said that I couldn't be able to rank all four Toy Story movies when I did the review of Toy Story 4. If Which one would be the one I would be like... The one I considered the best of the franchise. And out of all the four films, I would say the Toy Story 3 would be the least likely I would say that I would um, go revisit. And this is because of the very slow first act. Um, that is probably my only biggest criticism towards the film. Because it's just basically like, yes, of course, we all know Andy's grown up. But the thing is... The toys keep repeating it to Woody every single time. and But it is understandable why. Because we do understand why Woody is frustrated that the toys don't believe him. Because, of course, they thought that Andy threw them away. When Woody saw, they actually didn't because um, it was an accident. Um, but once we got into when uh, Lotso becomes the villain... Um, and this was the other animated film I saw on the big screen. Um, it was also a big surprise to me when I first saw it. That's when it really gets intense of the prison element to the film. And when Woody comes back, 
that's when the um, pacing, like the pre, um, goes back to the way like it did with the previous two films, and definitely shows a unique prison element escape from just a daycare led by an evil bear. And with the big climax of the garbage scene at the end, especially how a continued tradition occurs, like with one aspect kind of almost ruins a little bit the climax, like the first Toy Story with the car, um, um, few, like, you know what I mean, the car, um, um, it's the match scene, you know what I'm talking about, where Woody goes to the no, 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 I, I don't know the words in that moment, um, in the second, of course, when in the airport scene where the plane automatically closes before Woody and Jesse jump off when they heard that there was going to be more um, packages to come up, but that did not happen. And in the third one, of course, when they're all about to go in the incinerator and Lotso volunteered himself, uh, he decided to ditch them. And that's the traditional thing of how unexpected twist moments comes in in every Toy Story moment. So, yeah, that was just really evil right there definitely the best villain of the toy story series without a doubt and um do i consider it a best picture worthy nomination um i'm not really sure because as of course i uh, I'm, I'm recording this i've yet to watch any of the picture nominee the other nine picture nominees from that year which includes the social network the king's speech inception you name it um but I do. I don't actually mind it winning the Oscar. It's just that I do think the first How to Train Your Dragon really should have won that category, honestly, for me, um, because it would be. It's definitely a memorable one. I would say over Toy Story three, even though, yeah, I don't agree with um, How to Train Your Dragon sweeping at the Annies, the first one specifically, because that could have been a Rick thing. It is a Rick thing, by the way, um, but definitely. Um, Another great follow-up to the series, although I would say it's the weakest of all four movies, but um, definitely a worthy nomination, I would say. At number five, I have what many people probably consider this the most underrated animated film, um, animated feature winner to be precise, and that is Rango. Um... When it comes to um, the 2011 films, this was my first time watching all those nominees when I did that retrospective, and I was really amazed of this film in particular. Um, and this is mainly due to the phenomenal computer animation that came from this. And this is coming from Nickelodeon, by all means, as I stated in the retrospective. I mean, a story about this desert town with, like, not having any water in their um town and then this outsider comes in and ends up becoming of course like believe the new sheriff sheriff i haven't watched this in a, in a in a while but um it really just shows how um a unique adventure it is of this trying to figure out who's been responsible for hiding the um water here in their sound in their town specifically and with the phenomenal performance by johnny depp really is well amazing i mean this is definitely one of the best non-disney computer animated films just for its computer animation alone with the designs of the characters the realistic looks even having a fear and loathing in las vegas cameo which i actually surprised i didn't recognize that because of course i have that movie on the criterion collection in blue uh, the blu-ray of the criterion collection specifically so i did get that reference um, it's just the only thing is, like Toy Story 3, I don't mind it winning, but there was one film in particular I would have preferred, which would have been DreamWorks' is Kung Fu Panda 2, because unlike Rango, Kung Fu Panda 2 had me an emotional impact towards that film, uh, unlike this one, even though I did have a great time with this. And interesting enough, um, the day after I first watched this, I, of course, went to Books A Million, um, and I was surprised it was there, even though I kind of probably messed it up a little bit with the taping and stuff like that because there was a lot of like a strong massive tape in this so that's why it's kind of wrecked up a little bit but that's more my part but uh but owning a physical copy was just amazing to get so um definitely a worthy um watch um if you haven't seen it but amazing i would say so by all means it's very interesting how right now all right, so now we're getting into the top four, and you might have noticed 
a very interesting um, way. I'm kind of surprised how this ranking ends up turning out to be because in terms of all the winners in their respective years, Frozen was the only winner on my list that was at number five. Brave and Big Hero 6 were at number four. No, None of the winners were at number three in any of my rankings. And then Inside Out, Toy Story 3, and Rankin were at number two. And if you have seen the last, um, if you're wondering which ones are the last four, yes, that's right. The winners from 2016 through 2019 were all number ones. And that means they are in the top four. So it's kind of coincidence. I'm kind of surprised that it actually ends up being that. Um, I wasn't expecting that. But which one of these four I consider to be what is I consider to be the best animated feature winner of the 2010 decade? And at number four is a movie that seems appropriate on its position, Toy Story 4. Um... As I have stated in that review, I really had a great time with this one. Um, and of course, when I did revisit um, this film um, for this for the retrospectives here, um, this would definitely be at number three in my personal ranking. I know some people would consider this an overrated one or an unnecessary pick for a uh, billion dollar cash bait, um, but it still holds the connection as well as to the previous three here um definitely with the unique aspect of this would be like woody's ending i would say um for his adventure in the entire toy story series and um and with the relationship he has with uh forky of course who is very important to bonnie specifically and with his reunion with bo peep it's just really well put together. The new characters are really enjoyable. They all, like, although, um, like, uh, man, it's just like, they're a lot of fun, especially Ducky and Bunny. Gabby Gabby is a very unique um, villain um, in terms of the Pixar, um, in terms of the Pixar ones, because there's a lot of plot twists that you don't see coming, and it actually really works. Although, I would say that like, if there is, like, any major issues, it would definitely be some of the humor with some of the recurring toys, like, with Bonnie's dad going to jail and stuff like that. But I definitely agree that this definitely deserved the Oscar, without a doubt. I mean, definitely a phenomenal um, conclusion to Woody's story, and we can't wait to see um, how the conclusion for Buzz Lightyear in the franchise for the upcoming spinoff Lightyear will be. But definitely... A phenomenal conclu conclusion, I would say, if it is true, unless they make a fifth, but it's most likely, of course, going to be the Lightyear film, but definitely a worthy follow-up to the entire trilogy as well. At number three, I have Coco. Out of all the Pixar films of the 2010 decade, I think that this one is the best of, that, of the 2010s. Lee Unkrich's second film... Of his um, interpretation of the Day of the Dead is really an emotional moment for uh, our hero Miguel and his search for his great great grandfather, and this unique journey of him being in the Day of the Dead with his um, great 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 and family members. It's just a unique journey to see how um, he his journey is to try to not also find him, but like who his great grandfather is, but also to try to keep the spirit of music alive. Because of course, there is a massive reason why his family are not a fan of music, but he really wants to have this journey and wants to find answers to who his great grandfather is. I mean, it's just like the unique designs of the films, it's just like really well done. And Definitely also deserving the original song Oscar for Remember Me and really a, a unique, a great journey. Um, definitely, of course, another deserving Oscar without a doubt. And remember me. <laughs> there are only two animated feature winners left. One of them will be going home as what we call maybe the loser, if you call it for second place, and the other. I consider it to be the greatest animated feature winner of the 2010 decade. 
And at number two, or the loser for the number one spot, is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Okay, 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 okay. I know people are going to be upset that it's not number one, but you have to admit, at least it's high on the list. As I have stated with Big Hero 6, I am not a big superhero movie. This is actually a superhero movie I actually really had a good time with. It's actually really great. I mean, um, of, outside of The Incredibles, by the way, uh, with Incredibles 2, you are mentioning about this year in particular, um, the thing about it is how Sony Pictures Animation did it, uh, bringing Miles Morales to the big screen for the first time and having a different approach to different sorts of Spider-Mans really had a well-put-together movie by three directors with Bob Curtis, Ketty, Peter Ramsey, and Rodney Rothman, along with the producings of Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, this has definitely ended up being probably what many people consider to be the best animated feature from Sony Pictures Animation so far. I will, of course, say that I am not a die-hard Into the Spider-Verse fan. I don't consider it, like, one of the greatest animated films ever made. That's why it's, of course... At number two, I would say. And it's kind of a little bit of the fan base. I'm not really hyped up for the sequel, I would say. But just this movie alone, I really had a great time with. With the performances by Shamik Moore, uh, Jake Johnson, Ailey Steinfeld, of course. Perfect as Gwen Stacy, one of my celebrity crushes. Uh, and with, like, all the characters, the actions are just well put together. It, like... The only issue I would say with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse would be, like, not much development with Kingpin as a villain, to be precise, and a little bit of the father-son aspect that we have seen in other Phil Lord and Christopher Miller aspects as well, like the Cloudy films, films of course, especially the first one, or even the Lego movies, but it still really works well as not just a Spider-Man movie, but also a superhero movie in particularly. Um, definitely, of course, deserving of the Oscar, I would say this. Um, I don't consider it, like, the greatest animated feature winner of all time, but this is definitely up in the realms of one of the best choices of the decade. Now, before I begin with, uh, what I consider to be the greatest animated feature winner of the decade, I just want to throw up some honorable mentions of some of the animated nominees of the 2010 decade that I consider to be great, and I do recommend all of these. Um, except for, like, one, because it is an adult animated film, but it is still great nonetheless. And in alphabetical order, they are The Breadwinner, Chico and Rita, The Croods, Despicable Me 2, Frankenweenie, How to Train Your Dragon, How to Train Your Dragon 2, I Lost My Body, Incredibles 2, Kubo and the Two Strings, Kung Fu Panda 2, Missing Link, Moana, My Life as a Zucchini, The Red Turtle, Shaun the Sheep Movie, The Tale of the Princess Gaguya, When Marnie Was There, and Wreck-It Ralph. And my number one film that I consider to be the greatest animated feature winner of the 2010 decade is Zootopia. Okay, you might have seen this one coming because if you have watched my review of the film or I've mentioned it in a couple of other videos, and I'll stay, still say this to this day, that Zootopia is a masterpiece. This movie blew my mind the first time I saw it. And even revisiting for this retrospective, no other animated film couldn't even top it over. Not even Toy Story 4, Coco, or Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And the real reason why this worked so well is the phenomenal script here. The message of the movie is, of course, of its calling out of discrimination and bigotry, which has been a massive problem in our today's world during the last half of the 2010 decade and still to this day of the first two years of the 2020 decade. This is a movie that really fits well in our perfect timing of its message that is trying to say. And it actually is a message that is done right in a movie. In most films that do have a political message at the end, most notably the Spike Lee films, 
they would usually immediately call out and specifically call out the people that they are actually targeting towards. Case in point, the ending in Black Klansman. Which sometimes that could leave a little bit of a criticism because it might be considered as unnecessary or if the message of the film actually of the, would not make the audience think, think because they already knew it because the movie tells them. In Zootopia, however, it actually gives the audience to think on what the message of the movie is and actually what the movie is actually calling out. They don't say who they're calling out, but it's trying to tell you and you have to think on who they're calling out. And this has been a massive problem in recent years in the country, here in the United States. And I would not be surprised, as an American myself, I think the United States has probably been the most hated country ever since, I would say, since 2016 and still probably to this day. Because we have seen massive hatred that's been going on for the past few years. And that's just not good at all. Especially in the far-right fascism and nationalism and white supremacy issues. Yes, communism is also a bad thing as well. But there is two different things about it. Communism is basically a big massive empowerment of the government and low grades on the citizens. Fascism is still the rise of, gov of power, but fascism is basically you have the right to kill somebody. And that's not good whatsoever. We have seen this in many problems, of course, with not just the police force, but also with many forms of far-right groups that just want to silence the voices and say stop talking about politics or using cancel culture as a big excuse or even a way to try to cheat themselves for a future election to get somebody back in office and try to tell them that he is the greatest person to ever be the president when technically he is not. That's the issue what we have in today's culture. And although we are now in a new era with a new president that is trying to save us, specifically during a pandemic, but also to stop the hatred in this country towards minorities, especially in the African American community and the Asian community and the Latin Mexican Hispanic community, it's just like, like if you are hating any of these groups, then you are a complete um, ignorant person. You believe in fascism, nationalism, or even um, far-right white supremacy, or anything like that. Yes, it is a bit dangerous going political in your videos because you might leave a bad reputation, but that's what this movie is basically explaining. This is why Judy Hobbs is... The, her quote in the film, try to make the world a better place, is something that really needs to be today. Or should I say, try to make the United States a better place. Because we have been seeing many different communities to try to stop the hatred. And yes, stop Asian hate, Black Lives Matter, all those groups, mask up. up. You need to follow these rules, otherwise you might pay the consequences and might leave a bad reputation to yourself more so than the others outside you. So you have to be very careful. Now, I am an independent, I will say that. So I am kind of in the center because there are some issues I do have, like with both Democrats and Republicans. But the America needs to be a better country as it was and very peaceful during the days of the Obama era, the Clinton era. Heck, even both the, like the George W. Bush era, I would say even, it was still peaceful because there was no hatred going on. But when the Trump era began, that's when the rise of hatred really begins. And of modernized fascism, fascism, excuse me, is not okay in the United States or in the world. Communism, communism is of course bad, Fascism is bad as well. But this movie is trying to tell you, make the world a better place. And that's what the movie is, of that powerful message it has. 
And on top of that, of course, outside of the message, you have the phenomenal performances from Jennifer Goodwin and Jason Bateman. The predator and prey aspect is one aspect on why the message really worked. The amazing animation, the production design, the direction by Byron Howard and Rich Moore. This is why I consider it to be not also one of the best animated films of all time, but definitely a masterpiece that needs to be bring up a lot in today's movies. This is a movie that fits well in our time. Perfectly released at the time when hatred was about to begin to try to immediately call them out. And this is still a movie that really holds well today in our society. And that's why I consider Zootopia to be the best animated feature winner of the 2010 decade. And with that being said, Thank you guys for watching this 2010 retrospective. If you like this video, you can hit that comment, hit that like button and subscribe button and comment down below what is your ranking all the 10 films. I guarantee most of you are going to have Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse at number one. I would not be surprised about that. But um, I will also say I won't be doing um, a retrospective of the, the 2000s animated films. I had not planned doing that. Um, but if I could go back and do more retrospectives, it would be the other international and documentary films of the 2010 decade, which if I have the time, I will be doing that. But the next video you will be getting is, of course, my official Oscar predictions on my predictions on all 23 categories. So let's see what film is going to be taking the win before I do those reviews of the 2020 films. But... We'll have to wait and see, so I'll see you on Friday for my Oscar predictions.